more de- you see, did you see more decisive in, in, his, in his throws? Hard, hard for me to say. I don't know what his reads are and what they're telling him uh, based on coverages and stuff, but <clears throat> it seemed like the ball was coming out quickly. That's kind of general, but that's just sort of my litmus test as an offensive lineman. Is the ball being thrown or is it being held on to? You, you played uh, in a game last year, obviously. Uh, do you notice, do you generally notice that the game speeds up for those guys in their second year? Yeah, I think second and, and then even the third year is, to me, the year where quarterbacks especially make a really big jump. Um, for those guys to be able to go through a full year of watching games, watching practice, um, the, the review side of things, and then going out and either playing in game or playing in a practice and um, putting all those different concepts under their belt, I think makes them a much improved player in their second and third year. Excuse me. Well, I, I think as a as a quarterback, if you get sat down at halftime, there's a chance that your confidence is um, takes a hit. But I wouldn't expect uh, that it would be a long term hit. He's a guy that can bounce back quickly, and I'd I'd expect him to be able to bounce back by tomorrow. You know, usually you feel crappy on Monday, and you're able to watch the game and make the corrections. And by the time Tuesday comes around, you're focused on the next opponent and He's got the type of demeanor and personality. I think he would be able to bounce back quickly from that. Jordan, it's not your call, but would you like to see them stick with him and, and ride through this? With Hogan? Yeah, no, with, with, with Deshaun? With, uh, Deshaun? Yeah. You know, it's not my call. I, I think as an offense, uh, we'd be comfortable with either one of those guys back there. Um, I think offensively, it's nice to have fewer changes, the better. You know, So whoever they decide to go with, it's probably best for the offense to stick with them as long as you can, just because there is a lot of uh, coordination that needs to happen between the different facets of the offense. And the more time you can work together, the better you're going to be in general. I was going to say, you've been through this so many times, multiple quarterbacks playing in the course of the season. Does that uh, just kill any chance of growth as an offense? I don't think it kills it. I think it it could maybe hinder the skill players' development because I think what they do is rhythm and timing and different guys, even though you're running the same plays, are going to run them a little bit differently. But from an offensive lineman standpoint, I don't think it really changes a whole lot from what we do. Um, our coordination more is between us, the tight ends and the running backs, than really between the quarterback. Um, now he can help with redirecting plays and getting us out of bad run plays and things like that. But um, I think that's probably more of a receiver, guys that are catching the ball type mesh and coordination that needs to happen. Joe, uh, Kevin was the fourth quarterback throughout the offseason, training camp, and preseason and everything. And then obviously, you, you've won the backup job. But now every time he gets on the field, Baltimore last week, this past Sunday, he leads you guys to, to, to scoring points. Um, is it surprising at all that the way he, he's ascended? And how can you can you kind of wrap your mind around it and explain what he's been able to do when he's been in there? Well, it's interesting. I think the reason he was the fourth quarterback throughout the most of the offseason is I think the coaches kind of knew what they had with Kevin based on what he did last year. And I think they were trying to figure out Amongst the other guys, who's going to be the starter? And I think they kind of had Kevin maybe pegged for the backup role. And so they were thinking, all right, you know, fourth quarterback, and we'll let these other guys battle out for the starting job. But he just keeps getting better and better and better and keeps showing that even though maybe he wasn't a high draft pick, that when he gets the opportunity, he makes the most of it. He throws the ball to the right guy on time, on target. He does a good job with getting us on the right protections on the right guys in the pass game. He gets out of bad runs when they have a, a bad look on defense for us. So I think he's just 
the confidence of the, the coaching staff it just keeps growing when he's out there and uh, that's why I think he just kind of keeps moving up and um, has done a really good job when he's out there. What's the mindset of the line when the coach changes his mind and decides to go for it on fours and one? And was there a conversation in the huddle like this is on us, us five guys? I know you had three extra tight ends out there, but and why do you think that play failed? Well, that's a good question. Um, when you look at it, you, you always say, well, <clears throat> You could do better. You could block them better. You could knock them back better. And when you don't get it, that's always going to be the bottom line is we got to do a better job of <clears throat> knocking them off the ball and, and uh, getting the yardage that we need to get. Other side of the ball, obviously, but do you have any kind of takeaways from Miles Garrett, two sacks and 19 snaps and kind of one leg? Yeah. Well, I, I didn't get to see all of his snaps. I just saw a few from the game, but... Certainly when he's out there, he's a difference maker. And he makes your defense a different type of animal because then they have to start accounting for him when he's on the field, no matter where he is, whether it be different protections or help from a tight end or a running back. And um, a quarterback's going to be aware of it too because he knows where his problems are on the defensive line. And <clears throat> that's going to change the way he plays the game sometimes. So. Having him back there is a really big boost for the defense. Joe, do you feel like Hughes in a tough spot? Because we talked last week and you talked about it. The organization is in this massive rebuild and it's probably going to take years before it can even be judged. Yet, he's the guy walking around with a 1 20 record and feels that pressure to win Sunday. And that's why he you know, yanks the quarterback at halftime. So it's kind of that development versus win thing he's got to deal with. Well, I think that's the, the difficulty when you make a organizational decision to um, start with a, a rebuilding process that's going to take several years. The people that are coaching and playing are still going to try to win now uh, because no matter who's out on that field, they're going to do as well as they possibly can because they're trying to protect their own job and they want to do well and they want to try to win. So it's it's uh, sometimes you can feel, I'm sure if, if, as a coach, you feel like you're kind of stuck between rock and a hard place um, when uh, it seems like the people upstairs when they took over are, were looking for, you know, three, four year type rebuild. Um, it can, can feel difficult, I'm sure. You know, Joe, the training deadline's going to come up here in a couple of weeks and <laughs> your name's going to get mentioned again. But, uh, well, you just did it. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, Who are you trading me to? <laughs> I hope you don't go anywhere. But, well, uh, thanks. But, uh, you, know, you know it's going to happen. Yeah. So, so uh, did you think about that? Or what, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I start thinking about it when people ask me about it. And you're the first person to ask me about it. So, uh, I don't know. I, you just have to roll with it when it comes up. It's obviously a talking point every year. Uh, around this time and it always feels good when the trade deadline does pass because then the conversation about it can stop. So you still want to stay here even uh, I do. Though uh, <laughs> this rebuild you might be like 40. <laughs> well I hope it doesn't take that long but. <laughs> no I know you don't, players don't like to look back but the way uh, Garrett just had such an immediate impact even though he's not 100 percent Mm -hmm. If you were able to play that game, do you think this mm -hmm. season, would mm -hmm. you, the first month would have been completely mm -hmm. different? Well, I don't want to steal a column from you here because I know you're thinking about that this week. But uh, <laughs> certainly when you go back there and you say, well, he's a difference maker, he's a sack guy, all it takes is one play in a game that's close that will change it from a, lo a loss to a win. And when you think about like the Pittsburgh game where it kind of came down to one or two plays, if you got a guy in there that's getting two or three sacks, that changes the whole makeup of the game. And it can change the makeup of your season, but you know, as players, we can't live in the what if world, you know, because we've got enough things to think about and worry about during the week and uh, during a season. Well, back to the, uh, Did you see Jerry Jones's comments about not tolerating any players that might protest during the anthem? I didn't. You didn't? Okay, no. You said that they wouldn't let guys play if they protest. 
I was wondering, did the league say anything to you guys, or did the Browns give you either you know a suggestion or any kind of uh, demand that it would be no protests? No, we haven't really heard from the league, and I think the Haslam's have been working with some of the players um, directly and talking about you know different ways that they can improve the the city of Cleveland, the communities that our players come from. But uh, to my knowledge, there has been no directive or anything like that from uh, the NFL or ownership to not protest. Um, to go back to that fourth down run, was there anything unusual the Jets did on that? Was there anything when you lined up, did you say this is trouble? Or? Well, I was on the back side, so I can't always see what the look is on the front side. I think you know that it's going to be a loaded box in that situation. Um, and it comes down to a matter of a few inches. and. It's tough when you don't get it, but uh, I look at that situation where even if you don't get it, you're so close to the goal line and the way our defense was playing, you kind of expect the expected outcome would be a stop, get the ball back at about midfield and get a chance to go at it again. Um, so I was okay with the decision to go for it. Hey, Joe, going back to Miles, as he gets more and more snaps, can it wear an offense down when you have to deal with a guy like that for 60 minutes, especially when, like you said, one play? One mistake could change. Mm -hmm. um, I don't ever think that a defensive line wears an offensive line down because they've got to do so much more running um, on a on a play. But certainly, it changes how you can attack a defense. Um, <clears throat> you got to run different protections. You got to think about different runs. I mean, it, you have to game plan for a player that's as disruptive as he is. So. He's he's definitely a, a game changer. What was your reaction um, to JJ Watt getting hurt last night? I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. he's done for the season. Yeah, it was it was really frightening. Obviously, the to see a player in as much pain as he was in and um, as much distress, and the way they took him right to the hospital. I can't remember a lot of times outside of you know head and neck injuries where you see a guy getting taken right to the hospital. So, obviously. I was watching last night, and I was very, very scared, really. Um, really, my heart went out to him and his family having to deal with something like that. And the fear of the unknown at that moment is um, is really scary. And that's something that you hope happen, never happens to any football players. Um, and like I said, we see it with head and neck injuries sometimes where guys are transported to the hospital for cautionary reasons, but when you're talking about a lower leg injury, that's it's alarming to say the least. Because if you tear your ACL, I mean, I tore my ACL in college, and they just sat me on the bench the rest of the game. So you know that it's something that's really significant and dangerous when a guy's going immediately to the hospital, and and uh, it's tough to watch that because we think of ourselves as football players as sort of invincible. And even if we do get hurt, we tear an ACL or shoulder up or something, well, we can get the surgery and we can go back. And, you know, there's sort of that timeline. But when you have something that's an injury that you just don't see and you don't know what it is or what it could be, that's, that's really frightening.